Happy Monday, everyone. Welcome to Sermon Scraps for this week. Well, we're done. We made it to the end of the book of Amos. And Amos has been a really, really hard book for me to preach. Like each week it feels like there's another heavy topic that we're needing to dig into, to navigate through, to try to figure out how it applies to us in our context today. Um, so we, we made it to the end, but but I also feel like there's a lot of these, these ideas that came up in the book that push against our American ideals. Uh, so I thought I'd just begin sharing some of the things that stood out to me as I was studying it over these past couple months. Uh, first, and I think the biggest message and biggest takeaway for me from the book is that justice involves both spiritual and physical concern for people. So it, it, one, one commentary I was reading at the beginning in my prep work for the whole series was saying that, that Amos is essentially the book of James in the Old Testament. So James is, is uh, the, one of the big themes there is faith without works is dead. Um, and, and so Amos is kind of that Old Testament idea of if you are trying to separate or divorce your, your worship of God from your practical living and your care, concern for, for those uh, the society deems marginalized or the poor or the oppressed, uh, then your, your, your worship is, is completely worthless. Now, we, we have to kind of balance some of those things. One of the books I've recommended before is called When Helping Hurts, uh, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor and Yourself by Steve Corbett and Brian Fickert. Um, this was a really helpful book for me because um, one of the biggest issues churches wrestle through is how do we do benevolence or mercy ministry well in a way that equips them holistically as a person instead of just like giving handouts to people, which then doesn't really actually help lift them out of poverty and uh, those kinds of things. So this book was was really helpful. I'm actually reading a, a, another smaller book they did on this on on um, when helping hurts and benevolent church benevolence ministries, and and that one's been really interesting as well. Uh, the second big theme that I'm going to be taking away from this is that unacceptable worship is a big deal. So one of the, the things that we saw in in uh, Amos nine this week is that God said He would destroy the false temple that they built. Now I, I remember uh, studying this book in in seminary, and the professor at the time asked, "Which God are you worshiping? Are you worshiping the one true God of the Bible, or are you worshiping the God of the Baptists, or the God of the EV Free, or the God of the Lutherans? Which God is it that you are actually worshiping?" Uh, there's a quote from uh, 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 from Winston Churchill where he said, "We shape our buildings thereafter." They shape us. Now, that, that we can also apply that to worship, is, is that we shape our worship services, and then our worship services shape us. And so one of the questions that we need to be asking is, what does your worship say about God? Is your view of God being shaped and formed by the Bible, or is your view of God being shaped and formed by your own ideas? Uh, and then let's take it a step further. What does our weekly worship on Sunday morning that we just did when we gathered together yesterday, what does that communicate about God? Uh, we can take it even beyond that. What does our building, the structure, the, the, the architecture communicate about God? I've uh, one of the examples that I often think of is is uh, many times a day it seems that churches are just in like converted warehouses, <laughs> um, and 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 uh, there's nothing wrong with that because John four says God God you can worship God anywhere you're not limited by by place anymore because the the curtain in the temple has been torn in two, but that communicates something about who God is. Now, there's all these ideas. We've even looked at some of them already uh, that, that we need to hold intention when we think about who God is. One of them is the idea of the imminence versus the transcendence of God. The imminence is the nearness of God. And that is God is with us. God is in us. God dwells us as believers through his Holy Spirit. Uh, but we also have the idea that God is transcendent, that he is separate, completely separated from us because we are sinners. So we can't approach him just in our own strength and power. We need a mediator. That's where we need Jesus Christ to continually be interceding on our behalf. Uh, but those two, two things, how is God both near and far? It, it doesn't always make sense in our minds, but but uh, so so buildings even would communicate some of those things. Like a warehouse, you don't walk in and, and suddenly you're like in awe and shocked and amazed at the size of the building. It, it's like any other building that you would walk into. Now compare that to like when you walk into a cathedral. What's what's people's responses when they walk into one of like these old super uh, medieval cathedrals? You generally stop, stare up, and everyone quits talking. You're just overwhelmed with the transcendence of who God is. 
Now, now that affects even the ways that, that, that we would need to think about approaching our worship services. If you're at a big cathedral building, then you, you need to focus in your services on the imminence of God to, to try to make sure that both pieces are emphasized. If you're at a warehouse where it's, it, it communicates the imminence of God, you need to work hard to focus on the transcendence of God. If you want to dig into some of these ideas a little bit further, uh, one of the ones that I found very helpful is called Christ-Centered Worship by Brian Chappell. Uh, the subtitle is Letting the Gospel Shape Our Practice. Uh, really helpful just kind of looking at some of the, the history of liturgies in the church and ways that the church has tried to share, communicate, represent the gospel, even in our worship services. Uh, there, there's a line in here, I, I probably get, I'll probably butcher it, but I, I think it says something about the, the, the goal of our worship services is to represent the gospel. Um, so that those are some big overviews that, that I took away. Let's dig into Amos 9 here together. Um, first, ver- verse 1, is the Lord, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar. Now, what's interesting or ironic about this is this is the first time that God will actually meet with his people at the temple that they had built at Bethel. So there were all these instances in the past where, you remember I read from 1 Kings uh, 12 and 13 during the service on Sunday where Jeroboam created these false cultic centers at Dan and at Bethel. And they were using these as their attempt to worship God, but God was not pleased. He was not participating. He was not accepting their worship. Now he is. But instead of accepting their worship, God is present to destroy them, to tear them down. It will not be good. Beginning in verse 2, it says, if they dig into Sheol, and this begins a theme of five statements. So remember, there's a theme of five and seven throughout the book of Amos. And so this if and then from there statement. So uh, if they go into the five places are Sheol, heaven, Carmel, the sea, and captivity. So again, there's these themes throughout the entire book of Amos of fives and sevens. It's also, I, I, I talked about it just really quickly, but Sheol uh, actually represents the furthest point from God and a place where no one can praise him. So you begin with this idea of, of the temple, where God is finally among the temple here, and then you go quickly from the temple to this uh, as far away from God as you can possibly be and a place where you are not even able to praise God anymore. Uh, verse 3, I didn't even talk about this at all on Sunday. It says, There I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. Um, there's in Job this reference to a Leviathan, which is some some uh, serpentine sea creature. No one's completely sure what it is. It's a really interesting thing. We'll be able to ask God when we get to heaven what exactly he was referring to. But what's interesting about that is, is God even controls the animals. And what's crazy is when God commands animals, they actually completely and quickly are obedient, which is very different to the way many of us respond to God's explicit commands in our lives. Uh, Verse 4, I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. This is similar to God's command earlier in chapter 5, verse 14, where God commands the people to seek good and not evil. So because they continued on in their evil ways, God will fix his eyes on them for evil and not for good because they were not being faithful in seeking God's, uh, seeking the good of the people that they were interacting with. Um, verses 7 and 8, God starts comparing uh, Israel to the other nations who, who are nearby them. And one of the things that stood out to me in these verses is that God's rule and his reign and, and even his expectations for how the people were supposed to be conducting their lives are the same universally. So when, when you compare things to God's perfect justice and righteousness, every single group will have to face the same scrutiny. Or as we saw in Amos chapter 7, they will have to face the same plumb line of judgment. Yet in the midst of that, uh, God's people will still endure. So the second half of of verse 8 says, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. So even in the midst of this this plumb line of judgment that is going to be coming, God will will preserve a a remnant of people. And this shaking out that that verses 9 talks about, uh, that, that they will be shaken out among the nations, that even in the midst of that, God will preserve his people. Um, Another thing, I didn't talk about this at all in the message, um, but I I did that illustration of of a sieve and God shaking these things out to see who is is going to last until the end. Uh, I immediately thought of salt and like a little salt shaker when when I read this. And and where my mind then goes with with this idea of salt in the Bible is Matthew 5.13, where Jesus calls us uh, the salt of the world. And that means that as salt, we are supposed to be embedded in the culture. We're supposed to be seeking to transform the culture 
culture from the inside out. Another way of saying that is Amos 5.24. We're supposed to seek justice and righteousness in every sphere that we come into contact with. And that, that's, I think that's a similar idea to what, what God is getting at it here in verse 9. It says, For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among the nations. That is, they will be spread out and scattered out among the nations, where they, they will be able to seek and influence true justice and true righteousness in, in every sphere and every culture that they find themselves living in. And that's true for us today as well. We are commanded to pursue justice and righteousness in every sphere that we find ourselves in today. Um, getting into the restoration of Israel in verses 11 through 12. So as I mentioned, uh, those two verses, 11 and 12, are, are quoted in Acts chapter 15, which is the Jerusalem Council. Uh, but it's interesting because there's there's some slight change of wording in, in the Acts 15 passage. So I'm, I'm just going to read it. Uh, so while I'll, start, I'll start reading the Amos passage. So 11 and 12 says, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. The Acts passage says, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. So you can see there's some slightly different wording that, that James is picking up here in this Acts 15 passage. It's this tent of David, it's this remnant of mankind, and then these Gentiles, it's referring to all these other ethnicities that, that James is referring to here. Um, so, so James is actually taking this passage here in Amos and applying it to their modern day context, which then means that this Amos passage also applies to us today. So in, in verse 12, it's this remnant of Edom. James changes it, to, changes it to this remnant of all mankind. Now, what's interesting about Hebrew is Hebrew is only made up of consonants. And so later on, after the Hebrew was, was being passed down through generations in order to help people be able to pronunciate uh, the words correctly, they added vowel markers in. And so the, the words Adam and Edom could actually be the same in Hebrew. They just added slightly different vowel markers. So you could even argue that back in verse 12 here, that Edom could be referring to Adam, that is all of mankind together. Um, and, and then another theme that, that, that kind of popped up to me in this section that I, I didn't really think about until today um, was this theme where, where God continually says, I will. So verse 11, I will raise up. In verse 14, I will restore the fortunes. In verse 15, I will plant them on their land. God is the one who is sovereignly ruling over everything. God is the one who is going to bring these things to pass. And because God is the one who is sharing these things with us, we can know that, is going, that it, it will happen in the end. The last thing I wanted to say about this is... is um, Throughout this whole book, there's been a lot of judgment, there's been a lot of destruction, there's been a lot of, of condemnation for God's people. Uh, but we see here in these last uh, six verses, verses 11 through 15, that judgment and destruction doesn't have the final word. See, God, God is, is using this as a purifying, as a, as a disciplining, as a discipling opportunity to bring us to this ultimate day at the end where there will be a complete restoration of everything. Another way of saying this is sin doesn't have the final word. Sin doesn't win in the end. God wins. Uh, and so then at, at the very, the very, and this will wrap up this entire uh, book, at the very beginning of the book, it begins with the words of Amos and then ends in verse 15 with the words of the Lord, your God. So he, he's not divorcing himself from his people anymore. He says, the Lord, your God. This is our God who will continue fighting for us, who, yes, will discipline us. Yes, will allow persecution and difficulties to come in, in our lives. But in the midst of that, we have a hope that is sitting in heaven that we can put our entire confidence, our entire hope, our entire faith in because we know what happens at the end. Now, as we come to the end of this Amos series, don't forget to, uh, I'd encourage you just to spend some time maybe over the next couple of weeks reading through the book again. Think through some of the things that stood out to you. And if you feel led to, please let me know what, what stood out, what was encouraging, what was convicting, what you enjoyed, what you learned from our study in this book together. Uh, another reminder for you is next week, we're going to be starting a series titled, Why Do We Gather? based on Acts 2, 42 through 47. So if you want to start digging into that, go ahead and, and do that. You can read, read 
read, uh, you could even read the whole, whole book of Acts if you wanted to. I'm just going to be focusing in on what are those things that made uh, the gathering of God's people unique. And I'm looking forward to digging into this with you. If you have, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, we'll see you, Lord willing, on Sunday.